Um, so, uh, you know, I, I want to start by saying that we know it's exciting and maybe nerve wracking and maybe strange to be starting university. But we, uh, the community at Campion, are so excited to have you as part of our college. We're really eager to support you as you learn. Um, so that's just in general, but uh, about today's event in particular, and I think this is going to be true of orientation tomorrow as well. Um, you know, you're here because you don't know everything, and we know that's why you're here. So, and we're doing this because we want to be as helpful as we can. So I really hope that you feel free to ask questions, to engage with the presenters as we go along. I know that uh, presenters are always super keen to see people participating as much as possible. So feel free to uh, keep your video on, to raise your hand if you wanna ask something, to type things in the chat uh, if you want a question to be asked. We'll get started right away with uh, Scott J. Wilson, who is a uh, teacher of English and a uh, who also coordinates the Writing Across Disciplines program uh, next door to Campion at Luther College. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for Rudy for being here. Uh, there, like Sarah said, Campion certainly invested in the well-being of students in a number of different ways. Uh, I run a program over at Luther College, which is close by on campus that is called Writing Across the Disciplines, where we support instructors, teachers, students in terms of writing skills for a variety of different areas. So uh, I talk about writing a lot. I used to work over at the Student Success Center on campus at the Writing Center, running it over that, running that program over there. So just know that there are a variety of different options available for getting help on campus for your writing. And my presentation today will just go through some of the expectations that we have here at university about your writing and some tips on perhaps how to get into a mindset when you're coming into university that shifts some of the skills you might have learned in high school to a more uh, university level approach. And in some cases, these differences are not that significant. And other times they come as a bit of a shock. So if you're thinking about what to take away from the presentation today, just kind of think about the broader concepts of what I'm talking about in terms of some of the things about you know, finding your voice and having something to say and being able to articulate what side of a, a particular debate that you're on. So in many cases, some students who struggle with writing struggle in the sense that they feel like it's subjective in many ways, that it's based on whether your professor enjoys your writing or not, and that's the main factor. And part of that is that people see writing more like art uh, and less like science. It's less like math than it is like fine art or something. So there's gonna be many different types of essays you may be writing at university. And a main student problem that we hear all the time is that I get conflicting advice from every different instructor. Like, I don't know what, when I walk into my English class, they want this. When I walk into my biology class, they want this other thing. And what I've learned as writing across the disciplines coordinator is that writing is essentially the same. It's just like sometimes we end up speaking about it in different ways. The language we use to describe the certain parts of it are, are a little bit different. Uh, just remember that your academic writing is all about organizing ideas, making points, and then supporting them with evidence. So like organization, finding enough points to prove, your, prove that you're right, and then support those points with some sort of evidence. And so there's a little bit of a rigor to this. There's a little bit of uh, difficulty in terms of it. There's a, maybe a higher expectation. We're not looking for fact-finding missions as much as we are getting to, for you to look at certain things and then tell us what you think about them. And so sometimes this goes against some high school advice where your teachers may have said, don't have any opinions in, in your writing. Your writing should be objective and, and professional. But 
there is professionalism in having an opinion and having thoughts about a certain thing. So what we want you to do is think about your papers, your writing, and even your reading and your thinking while you're starting your university degree and throughout as a debate where you establish the correct answer. So you're making an argument and it doesn't mean that you're mad at someone. It doesn't mean that you have to get completely all like riled up and, you know, it's like the wild west of an internet comment section or something. You're, you're, you're thinking about it in terms of what do I think about this? Where do I stand relative to other people about this topic? And what's at stake here if I'm right? Or what's at stake if I don't do enough to convince my reader that, that I am correct? So we're looking for where do you stand on the issue? You know, make that argument, uh, prove that it's valuable. You know, if I'm right, here's here are the good consequences that come from this. Or if you're talking about your reader and your audience, you're thinking if if they if they don't believe you, there's some other consequence to that. That can be that takes good writing and elevates it into great writing, where there's something at stake there, where there's something really important. So we're, we talk about this as having something to say. Uh, not just simply going through the motions of doing your writing because you've been asked to do it for an assignment and then handing it in and, and moving on, but but thinking about investing your emotion and your uh, your intellect and, and your thoughts and all those kind of things into the process here. So we're looking for you to speak and write with conviction, you know, really to believe in what you're saying and 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 to have thought about it enough that you're confident with your, your answers. And part of that involves maybe thinking about something that interests you, certainly. That's usually the easy way when you're thinking about writing. But in many of your classes, you, you might get some essay prompts where they might be a little confusing or challenging. You're thinking, I don't really know about, a lot about that. That might be starting from scratch and that might not be you know, the way I wanna go. But I find, that oftentimes if you do that, you end up having more interesting things to say. You have to think a little bit more about it. You're coming at the topic fresh. You're looking at the sides of the debate with a uh, clear vision, and then you're able to see what you've learned throughout the writing process. So what we're often looking for is something that answers these questions and you're, you're, you're your profs are constantly thinking this and your readers constantly thinking this and they think you're right. It's so what and who cares? Which might sound harsh or dismissive or, or maybe a little bit rude, but it's a constant thing of like, you know, tell me something that's interesting. Tell me something that's new. Tell me something that's relevant. Uh, tell me why you're invested in something, you know? Why should I care? And who does it matter to this who cares part? If you're right, what happens if you're right? Uh, if you're in a, a history class or something and, and you're looking at a time period and you're thinking, I'm gonna apply some sort of contemporary theory to this other time period, or maybe you un uncover something new about a certain area or a history time period. You know, if you're looking at that differently, what changes about our understanding of that time period, about the people that you're referring to, about the, the society that you're referencing? And all this can seem a little bit overwhelming. Admittedly, we have uh, 13 weeks with you in any given class, and we're asking you to sort of become an expert on a topic that you're writing about in a very short period of time. While you have all these other things in your life going on, you're juggling your job, your other classes, your family commitments, et cetera, et cetera. And so you don't need to know it all, but you need to think about your place in the discussion. Oftentimes we don't really express how we really feel in our writing. Again, there's that kind of robotic stereotype that happens when we talk about academic writing. That word opinion, that might have been drilled out of you in high school for some strange reason. You know, we try not to insult people, we play it safe. And in many cases, we try to figure out exactly what the prof wants us to say, which certainly can be useful. 
but we often like take ourselves out of the spotlight. And you'll hear in a lot of your classes that you shouldn't use first person I when you write. I think, I believe, these sorts of things. But, but they want to hear what you think and believe. And so that's a rule that is slowly going out of fashion. Certainly if you're in classes and your prof is a stickler for that, you know, continue to write in the third person. But think about it as your idea still. Your writing is a process where you're able to get what's in your head onto paper or on the computer screen and tell somebody else, giving them a glimpse into, into what's going on in there. So having a little bit of intellectual courage, if everybody in the class seems to be thinking about a certain topic in a certain way, and you wanna write about it in a different way, you know, do that. Take pride in that point of view that you have. Don't just think again of essays as a means to getting marks. They certainly are that. That's a good part of being becoming a good writer. But being a good writer is a good being a good thinker. And you'll the more time you put into those writing assignments and, and trying to develop your writing and your reading skills while you're here, uh, that's gonna lead to more success in your classes, it's gonna lead to success in your careers. And, it, and it's just fulfilling to be able to express yourself in a way that resonates with people. And so embrace that I part of it. There's a really good book by uh, some people that are mentioned on this slide, Graf and Birkenstein called They Say I Say, and it really you might have used in some of your intro English classes, for example. And they really hammer this home. We're not just thinking about what other people say. Your, your professors are people who are experts in their field. And so they know what these authors are talking about. They're familiar with the people you're referring to. They want a balance of what those other people are saying, but also what do you think about them? So make sure you're genuinely responding to another point of view. Don't just list observations about a given subject. You know, don't just go through your course notes and jot down every bullet point that came up and throw them in. We're having you analyze what other people have, are already saying about a topic, coming up with an argument in response to that and saying that why your viewpoint is significant. And so writing is like a conversation, a back and forth, it's a dialogue, which might seem odd because writing is often seen as a very solitary act. But if early in your essays you can establish the people in this field think the following ideas or they've expressed the following ideas, and then you're responding to those ideas and saying, I agree with them, I don't agree with them, or I'm bringing something new to this discussion and I'm adding on to what they're, they're saying, but maybe putting a different spin on it, that can be really useful. And that takes a little bit of time to develop. We talk sometimes about a concept called self-authorship where you're sometimes when we were young, like when I was coming to university, when I was your ages, my level of self-authorship and awareness about who I am and, and what I think and having the ability to respond to other people uh, isn't, what it is now and it's a skill that you'll develop as you go but it's something if you think about it and concentrate on doing you can get you can develop it way faster so acknowledging the opinions of others adds legitimacy to your argument we do want to hear what other people are saying but we want to you know add complexity to your writing by doing that and even if you believe those other people are wrong Right? If you go into an essay and you know what you're going to argue and which side you're on, learning from those different ideologies and figuring out why do those people think the way they think can really help you develop your own argument and strengthen your own argument, but also it adds a certain level of respect where you can say, I appreciate what these people are saying, however, I'm, I'm talking about it in a different way. Again, it's, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's significantly different sometimes from those conversations that we have on social media sites where people are just kind of posting links as a response and 
you know, sarcastic memes and all these things, which have their time and place, certainly. But it's more of a controlled response back and forth of trying to appreciate those other sides. So it's really important that when you're thinking about this, writing is a three-step process. And I often find that students and people in general uh, don't do the first one enough, this listening stage. So that's your listening part or the reading part. Where am I relative to these other people? Step two is summarizing and analyzing those ideas in your own words. You're gonna be asked to paraphrase and summarize some of those ideas that you're learning in classes quite a bit. So it's hearing what they're saying, trying to write those things down in your own words so that you can process it properly and express it clearly. And then once you've done that, you're getting into the responding with your original ideas. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like arriving at a party or an event and people are already in the middle of a conversation if you just jump in and say what you think, people are going to probably respond with, well, you know, Janine said that five minutes ago. I'm like, well, how about this? Tom said that 15 minutes ago, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to sort of wait, get the tenor of the argument, hear what where people stand relative to different ideas, say what they've said before. And then you come in and it becomes an easier process to, to express yourself and be part of that actual conversation. So even before you get going, it's listening, summarizing in your own words, and then getting down to the writing. That writing then has three steps. They're not really distinct. You can go back and do more planning later. You can edit on the fly if you like. But in a busy semester, you want to spend more time in the planning stage than you're going to be comfortable with. Uh, as a student, and a lot of times as a professor, a chronic procrastinator. So you want to be kind of thinking about things. And I promise you, the more you're doing on planning and brainstorming, the easier the rest of the process is. So brainstorm and come up with your ideas, outline them, organize them into some sort of structure. And then look at those sides of the argument like I've been talking about. The earlier you can get a start on that, the better. And that's even just finding the articles you're going to respond to or developing a little bit of an outline and having it posted somewhere on your wall or have a reminder set on your phone or like if you're working in Google Docs or whatever you're doing, just have it there as a bit of a reminder that you need to get going on it at some point. Uh, the drafting stage, that's the actual writing part. Please just remember that it's a draft is a draft. It's a work in progress. You don't need to worry about what it looks like. You should, though, to maximize your ability to know what you're thinking and just improve the final overall product, you should have multiple drafts before you hand it in. And this is one of those things if you're a very strong student in high school and you only ever did one draft and the results were great, just know that that may sometimes happen at university, but it's always good to increase the probability that it's gonna happen and you're gonna succeed by thinking about this three-step process, planning, drafting, and then the editing or revising stage. Again, even if this editing stage is something where you say, I'm gonna get the paper done a day before it's due just so I can spend, or sorry, two days before it's due so I can you know, spend the day before it's due looking for typos, eliminating repetition, making sure that you're sustaining one argument, uh, checking to make sure that all your citations and style issues are, are resolved. And as the semester goes and there's this sort of general chaos of midterms and then final exams, if suddenly you, you're like, okay, 
well, I'm going to get it done 12 hours <laughs> before, and then I'm going to take a break and then look at it again. But no matter what the timing is, some people like to have the essay done a week before. Some people like to have it done a couple of days before. You'll learn your how you're working with your writing process. But if you're someone who doesn't really think about it as that planning stage, the drafting stage with multiple drafts and the editing stage, start to adopt some of those habits right away. I promise they, they will help you a great deal. So when I worked at Student Success Center, we would have one tutoring office dedicated to writing and right beside it was a office dedicated to statistics and math help. And students would come into the statistics and math help room and just sort of proudly throw down the work they're struggling on. Like, help me with my stats. I'm terrible at stats. And people seemed excited about it and they didn't seem ashamed about it um, and asking for help. But then in the writing room, it always had a very different vibe. People would be like clutching their essay to their chest and holding it close and, and you know, worried. Like, don't want, they don't want to show it to the person that's going to help them because they're embarrassed about it. And so sometimes people consider themselves like th that they're not a writer or some people do consider themselves to be a writer. Like it's some sort of superpower or something or some sort of ingrained thing that you're born with. And certainly people can be, you know, have a higher chance of being good at something. But in a lot of cases, writing is very difficult because it takes a lot of repetition and practice and you fail more than you succeed when you're, when you're writing stuff. It's perfect in our head when we think about it and we try to get it out of there onto, onto our computer and it gets all jumbled. So it's not magic. Uh, if you have sort of been told your whole life that you're not a good writer, or you're not a writer, classified yourself as this, there's a chance to change this attitude. Graf and Birkenstein talk about having an inventory of basic moves. Stephen King, the horror author, talks about this as having a writer's toolbox. So you might have some things you go back to all the time, like your hammer and screwdriver, etc. And they're, you know, more prominently placed and you can find them easily because you've used them recently. So they're usually sitting on the top. But there will be other things in the box that you can go to. And, and so you'll learn these things in each of your classes. You've learned some of these already in high school and before. And, and you'll be able to draw on them when you need them. And so repetition is key to being successful. The practice is really important. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about this a little bit in Outliers. This theory has been torn apart and questioned, but uh, his argument was that if he looked at, you know, prolific people from history and said they had, all of these people had one, something in common, and that's that they had about 10,000 hours of practice to become great at something. Now, they had 10,000 hours because of their certain privileges. Uh, you know, Bill Gates had access to a supercomputer when he was a teenager, and uh, Wayne Gretzky would have had the luxury of having the sort of like time and, and parents who had enough money to let him practice as much as he, do, he does, et cetera, et cetera. And so I know you don't have 10,000 hours, particularly in any given semester to do that. But my point here is that you can spend a little bit more time than you have in the past or a lot more time, depending on your process and your writing, I promise it'll improve. And if you need some places where you can practice this, uh, one site that I like is 750words.com. So a lot of your assignments are gonna be 500 words, 1,000 words, 1,500 words. 750 words is roughly like, you know, two to three pages. 
750words.com is a site that basically asks you to write 750 words a day and it will reward you with cute bird badges and uh, sort of gamifies your writing process. You're an egg and then you're a chicken and then you're a turkey. Like a phoenix at one point. And a, well, a Pegasus is not a, not a bird, but anyways, it'll reward you for these things. It'll analyze some of the things that are going on in your writing. It'll talk to you about your mood. It's a little creepy that way. Uh, you don't have to use that feature. But basically, you can write anything you want in here. If you're working on an assignment, you can pop it in 750words.com. If you want to rant about your day, <laughs> you know, pop, put it in there. Scott's making you write an essay. I hate this class. Like, whatever it is, just throw it in there. And what happens is over time, you'll find that some of the ideas you pop in there, you're writing your draft, they're good. Other times, they're not. But when someone says, hand me a 500-word paper in, in two days or something in your class, it's no big deal. Um, I had a student when I worked over at the public policy school who was struggling with writing and struggling with motivation. And I was saying like, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be about policy. It can just be about whatever you're interested in. And I said, do you have like hobbies or stuff? And he's like, no, 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 things that you, care about and he said Jennifer Aniston can I write about Jennifer Aniston and I said well I probably don't want to read what you're writing with Jennifer Aniston but certainly go ahead and he was practicing and listening to podcasts and you know just becoming better at getting in, into the routine of this it's like exercise um, comes easier the more you do it if you're on the flip side of this and your problem is that you write way too much all the time Somebody gives you 500 word word count and you're constantly handing in 2000 words. Six word memoirs is a cool site where you basically express uh, an idea, a story, a thought in six words. And you can post these to the site and it's got a little bit of a social media component where people vote them. It's a good practice at being succinct and to the point. And I've had students do a one week social media challenge before where instead of posting online in a way that's very short form and, and a lot of uh, emojis and stuff, people try to write in full complete sentences for a week just to like exercise this muscle. You should tell people that you're doing this before you do it because otherwise it looks like you've been kidnapped and somebody stole your phone and they're posting stuff. But again, you'll you'll seem like a lunatic to your friends, but it, it really does it gets into that groove of when someone says, give me a 1500 word essay in two weeks, you're like, yeah, 1500 words isn't a big deal at all. Does anybody have questions? You can say them out loud or you can type them in the chat at any time. So at this point, <clears throat> you know, figure out what you have to say, figure out where, what you think relative to other people, embrace those thoughts. You know, I wanna hear what you think and feel about certain subjects and get into that routine of that three-step process, planning, drafting, revising, practice. And what we're asking is for you to be critical readers as well as writers. And this is the other thing, this is big advice. I am the writing across the disciplines coordinator, but reading and writing go hand in hand. And oftentimes people who are quite good writers are people who read more <clears throat> than other people. So you want to be a critical reader, not just someone who's a little bit passive about their intake. So be honest about your comprehension. Don't fake what you don't know. Uh, you will get called on it. Resist manipulation. So ask questions. Just because something is published and you've been asked to read it for your class doesn't mean there are not flaws with the article or the thinking or, you know, if it's even if it's a published book in a collection or something. People, ideas change, people 
miss certain things, you know, so don't just believe everything you're told. Ask questions of your profs, of yourself, of your classmates and look up answers. We want critical readers to base judgments on evidence. This is a massive one. While, you know, your teachers may have said before, opinions are a problem in this kind of writing. At university, they won't ask for your opinion. We do want your opinion because opinions are judgments based on facts. You've looked at the evidence and then you've come to an opinion. What we're looking at less of are beliefs, things that you just feel are true. Again, back to the Facebook interactions you might have. People feel things very passionately, particularly these days online, and they don't have evidence to back up what they're saying, or the you know, other they have is faulty and sketchy. Also, be thinking about your connections between other subjects. You're going to have these feelings of, I think this relates, the stuff in my English class relates to my film class. I think this stuff in my political science class relates to this history class or my business class. You're right about that. They do. So think about how these things are all working together. And as I said before, that intellectual courage, be intellectually independent. You feel something, you believe something, you have opinions about things, turn those into debatable arguments that you prove. So the big thing here is that writing at university is critical thinking. It involves knowledge transformation rather than listing or memorizing. So I don't want you to just go to Wikipedia and list all the facts. I don't want you to just open your textbook and then write them in an essay. That's certainly part of it. Knowing the facts, understanding them is key, but I want you to turn the articles you're being asked to read, the materials you've been given for your class, the ideas that you're learning there, Take that knowledge, transform it into something. Don't just list or memorize. Some classes you will memorize and that's what you'll be tested on. Other classes, particularly ones that are pretty writing heavy, involve you taking what you've learned and turning it into something else. Again, that's not easy. It takes practice, but that comes back to that, so what, who cares? And so I find that oftentimes we don't spend enough time with that initial planning process, like I mentioned before. And part of the issue there is because reading things longer than you think. So not just students, but anyone underestimates the time it'll take to read something, right? So if someone hands you a book and it's 200 pages, people say, I can read this in X number of hours. Someone gives you a 30 page article, you're like, ah, this is 15, 20 minutes easy. So Linda Briskin did this study and really found the proof about this. Reading at university should be the most time consuming aspect of your academic life. I know that's sort of a heartbreaking thing to hear for, for many people. Uh, but the more you're reading, and keeping up with your readings, the better you're going to be at it. But part of this involves actually understanding how long it takes. You'll be able to do more reading if you can actually schedule time and say, here's how long it'll take me to read this chapter. Sometimes we'll plug it into our schedule and we'll put 30 minutes in there. And then 30 minutes is up and we're only halfway done. So you can try this time management exercise. And you do this on your first week of class, right? So if you're walking into your sociology class and they assign you a tech. What you should do is time yourself when you're reading chapter one, write down how many pages it is. Don't race, don't try to set a personal best, but just read like you would on any, any day. Because studies show that students think they should be able to read one page per minute. That would be amazing. If everyone at the university was reading a page a minute, we'd all we'd all be better off. Uh, it would be it would be fantastic. 
But if you're actually reading and thinking and, and maybe jotting down a couple of notes and really trying to take it in, you're not rushing yourself, it's four to six minutes a page, which suddenly turns that idea that the article that you're assigned that's 30 pages long, it's suddenly, it's not gonna take you 30 minutes. It, it's gonna take you far longer than that, right? So if you can, and there's no shame here in if, if it takes you longer to read, so that's an average, but if it takes you a little bit longer to read the page of your textbook, like that's fine. But also if you don't read very much, all the studies show that if you do the reading that's assigned in your first semester of university, as much of it as you can, you'll go up three or four reading grade levels right away. And so again, much like the writing muscle to, to exercise this one with the time too. So you'll be able to plan better instead of setting aside an hour to read the, the article or the chapter, you'll set aside a couple hours and, and you'll be able to, to handle it. Because otherwise you'd be like me when I was in my undergrad, just sitting outside the room right before class, trying to speed read the, the story for my English class and, you know, trying to get involved in class discussion and totally misunderstanding who, which characters what and embarrassing myself, which is fine, a learning experience. So people underestimate the time it takes to read. They also underestimate how general they think profs want the information in an essay. What you're writing about needs to be very specific. So part of the issue with writing, and part of, if, if you're someone who writes, you're like, I couldn't possibly get this done in five pages, I wrote 10. Your professors aren't gonna like that very much. Uh, number one, that's a lot more marking to do. But number two, we're looking for your thoughts on specific areas. For example, if you're in a nursing class, sure, the general topic is health, but you can always be more specific. Perhaps the class is about medical technology. But within medical technology, there's lots of different types of technology. And so specifying one of them is helpful. So you move from medical technology down on this page to robots in medical care, like what type of robots in medical care, socially assistive robots? What are those socially assistive robots doing? Who are they helping? Older adults, older adults of a number of health concerns. So older adults with dementia. Then you add older adults with dementia and issues of companionship. Socially assistive robots, older adults with dementia, companionship and dependence. And so what this is, I'm trying to show you here is that if you are writing an essay about something that's about something at the bottom of this page, the more specific parts, it'll be way easier to make an argument about this topic. Should we use these robots in this setting where people with dementia are struggling with companionship and dependence? But if you dive in there and you're looking for stuff to write about and you can't find anything, it's way easier to go up this page than it is to come down the page. So if you were Googling or on the library website, which is the better thing to do, medical technology articles, you're gonna, you're gonna find millions of articles. But if you're typing in something about older adults with dementia and social assistance robots, suddenly you have a reasonable number of articles to, to deal with and think about and write about. So you can do this in any class that you're in, right? So if the, classes about geography of the third world, even within that class, you can specify a continent, a part of the continent, a country within the, co the continent. And then suddenly you're talking about road networks and infrastructure and their impact on malnutrition and gun, right? So try to be with your arguments and what you're writing about, be as specific as you can. If you're in an English class, for example, uh, your job is not to talk about everything that's happening in the book. You pick one idea from the book and focus on it. 
sometimes you're focusing on one chapter in the book, one character in the book. So that really specific topic that's informed by doing as much reading as you can and figuring out that specific topic will lead you to develop an argument. And I've said that word a lot, argument. That's really what we're looking for. And so whether someone's calling it a thesis statement, a research question, uh, they're talking about your opinion, uh, they've asked you to take a side, this is that debatable argument part. Thesis statements, people teach them in different ways, certainly. Sometimes in high school, your teacher is specified. The thesis statement is the last sentence and it's underlined. Sometimes that underlining is a lazy marker strategy. They don't want to read the whole thing and find where your thesis is. They just want you to confess to what which one you think it is. But that's not going to be exactly be the case here. So there will be rules to follow in your classes, but just think about thesis statements as a condensation of your analysis. It's a debatable point you're proving through writing. I mean, I think there's a lot of important points that I'm making in this presentation today, but if you can re remember this part. It'll serve you well. Regardless of what you're writing, which class you're in, your main argument or thesis has two parts. Oftentimes people just focus on the first one and they leave it at that. A thesis statement needs a claim, a debatable point you're proving is correct. That's the side you're picking. But it needs number two. It needs a reason why the claim is true and or why it matters. This is that thing about the stakes that I was talking about earlier. Here's what I think, and here's why it matters that I'm right. Or here's why, here's what I think, here's why I'm right. And you could also add the, and here's why it matters if I'm right. And so you can, you can determine that based on if the why part is obvious why it's important, then you just leave it at that. If the why part is more of like the reason why you're right is more of a fact or it's more based on, on evidence, then you include this why it matters part. But the claim and reason, lock them together early in your paper and spend all your time finding evidence that proves that claim and reason correct. This will go a long way. In high school, you may have been taught a uh, style of thesis statement where you come up with a general claim and then you have three, four reasons why you're right. Oftentimes the university, we're gonna ask you for one main reason why you're right. And then you have different evidence in your body paragraphs to prove that that is correct. Uh, you wanna avoid in many classes, what we call like a grocery list thesis. I'm right for 17 reasons. Like, well, that's not very interesting. Like, or maybe your topic's too simple if there's 17 reasons why you're right. Maybe it's not specific enough, you know? So, that specificity, that quality over quantity is what we're looking for. So that thesis statement takes a stand, it creates debate and discussion. It allows you to express one main idea and, and say that throughout. This is often true if you're writing a two page essay for your class or you're writing a 150 page thesis. It's usually rooted in one main argument, right? Expresses one main idea, but it has a lot of different evidence and explanation as to how you're proving that you're right. And again, that, that idea about the is specific. It's not about some general statement about African geography. It's one specific argument about a certain policy decision that's being made in the country, right? So always think about that thesis statement as an evolving process. It's something that changes as you're writing it. You'll go in and say, here's my awesome thesis statement. I'm totally right. And you'll like kind of wash your hands of it. But then you'll start reading stuff 
for your essay and you'll start to think maybe I'm not quite as right if I consider these years or this culture or this factor. And that's good. So think about you know what patterns or implications emerge when I look at your evidence closer. You know, are you still right? Can you adjust your argument? Maybe you're right and you know you're right, and you feel you're right, but you can't find evidence that you're right. So they'll always be thinking, what kind of evidence could I come up with to support this? In some of your classes later on in your degree, you'll be doing interviews and, and gathering information that way because you're like, there's nobody wrote about this. I need to go find it. There's also a freeing, empowering part of this process is when you can sort of think about how can I explain the mismatches between my thesis statement and my evidence? This is what more people who are on the Facebook rants need to do. They take a position, someone sends them evidence that they're wrong, taking a moment to think, ah, oh, interesting, maybe I'll look at this and consider it. Do that as much as you can. And then rewrite your thesis to accommodate the evidence that doesn't fit. There's no shame at all in doing that. That's what we're here for. That's what your learning process is. That's why the writing process can be so fun and empowering for you is to think about what did I think before I started writing this essay and what do I think now? We are not doing our jobs here at the University of Regina if you come in to university and you're leaving with the exact same ideas as you had before. Uh, and so that's not, that's not a, that might be a scary proposition. That might be kind of a weird thing to have happen, but it can be very exciting. So the last point here that I'll make um, is just a couple examples quickly, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, the, when I was talking about claims and reasons and having both, you can see some here that based on those socially assisted robot examples, the claims are in blue and the reasons are in green. It's more likely that as many popular science fiction novelists and movie writers have warned, these robots will simply enslave the human race because that's what our artificial intelligence does in those books. It believes the best way to protect ever unpredictable humanity is to control it. Um, you could also take approach where the blue claim is SARs must be user friendly enough for healthcare workers to adjust settings while not having to spend too much of their time training. That's the claim. You give the reason why that's right because such a situation would negate the time saving benefits of the technology. So these are two people going to be given the same topic, coming up with the same, like a different uh, take on it and, and coming up with different arguments. Sometimes students find classes that have a lot of essays in them frustrating because instead of just listening closely and writing down the answers you've been given in your lectures, you're actually coming up with the, the right answers. I will leave it there. Uh, give us a little bit of time for questions. Uh, so just kind of think about those things again. Writing is a process where you're, you know, invest, put yourself in there. We do want to hear what you think, but make those claims. Give us reasons why you're right. Find that evidence. Uh, build that time to practice into your schedule, particularly in this first to develop those good habits early. And constantly be open to the idea that as you're writing, you're going to find new things and have to adjust. That is the thrilling but sometimes frustrating part particularly when you're on a deadline i promise you'll get better at this as you go through your degree thank you for your time and if you have any questions i'm more than happy to answer them thanks so much for that scott um i uh, i i anticipated that perhaps students would be a bit shy to ask questions but you know students feel free to write something in the chat or unmute yourself and, and ask a question if you have thought of something. But I did wanna know, you know, um, students will be hearing tomorrow in orientation and throughout their education about places like the Campion Writing Center or the, uh, the Student Success mm -hmm. Center where they can go for help. Um, if I'm a student who's working on a paper and I'm struggling, what's the right time? Should I come in with a draft? Should I, you know, come in with nothing written down? When, when do I go for help? 
that is an excellent question. And my answer is probably not the greatest because it's basically, it, re it really depends. I mean, at any of those stages, you, you should feel like you, you should go and get help. Like if you're struggling with, for example, brainstorming, and you can't, you can't really get into, you can't really get into the flow of your essay and your time struggle getting started. And you can go to the writing center with your assignment sheet and have them help you develop that. Uh, you can also, when you have a draft, take it in and get get an opinion from the tutor on what needs to be changed. Uh, and so I'll put in the chat a link to you, Regina, right hub and this has a list of online resources zoom workshops uh things that sarah mentioned campion writing center the english department has a writing center uh student success center is a really good resource the global learning center has has tutors uh whether that's for essay writing or for english coaching and First Nations University has some writing help. La Cité has writing tutors as well, if you're uh, taking classes through La Cité. Uh, these things are readily available. They're one of those things that I was saying before about the procrastination. Sometimes people are coming in hours before the papers do to get help, and sometimes it's a little bit too late, but uh, some of them are fairly hands-off. You can send your paper into writing at eregina.ca, for example, which is the Student Success Center. And the, they usually have about a 24 hour turnaround where they can send you back some feedback. If you want a more one-on-one -on -one approach and talk to somebody, they have Zoom set up so they can share a screen and type together in Google Docs and that sort of thing. So that's a long way of saying there's plenty of help available and it's available at any part of the process. So if you're, if, if you're fine, you get a hot start on your essays and you really know where you're going and it's more about getting rid of those sentence fragments and the fine details, you can do it at that stage. But also tutors are trained in a lot of ways to identify what profs want out of those assignment sheets. So you can um, ask them for help there. I have a question uh, here in the chat from Brooke. Yeah. She says, earlier you said in high school, we learned to have a, a general main topic then support it with three subclaims. But in university, we have my, one main idea that we support with three different pieces of evidence. Can you talk about what's the difference? Yes, I can. Uh, the example I always give when you're thinking about having a claim and a reason and having that form the basis of your argument and then supporting it with evidence is when we think about a court case, you spend a lot of the pandemic listening to true crime or what, uh, watching law and order reruns. People will say something like in a court courtroom, the claim is guilty of murder. And then they will say he's guilty because of the DNA evidence, the eyewitness testimony and fingerprints on the murder weapon. But evidence does not, is not the same thing as reason for the claim. And so a lot of times what people skip over is the motive for the crime. Like they're really proving the motive. Like the claim is guilty of murder. Why he did it is the reason. And then the evidence supports the claim and the reason uh, because both sides, for example, in the court case will say DNA evidence was at the crime. Like, yeah, there's DNA at the crime scene, but uh, that was his apartment. Of course, it's there. Uh, there are fingerprints on the murder weapon, but his fingerprints are suggest he was chopping garlic and not stabbing someone. And the eyewitness testimony from the person was from a person who said two years ago that he was going to do everything in his power to ruin this person's life. So, and evidence changes based on motive. If the motive is, uh, you know, jealousy or rage or something versus you know, money, the evidence that's going to be that can be provided there is going to be different. And in your essay, it's the same thing. The reason for your claim in your essay writing is going to inform which evidence you use. So in a lot of times in high school, it's this very general claim and then list all the evidence you have to prove that you're right or list four or five different reasons. But typically a good argument focuses on, let me find a main reason why I'm right and then find different evidence that supports that claim and reason. Um, 
so it's a very good question. There is a subtle difference there, but I, I just find if you remember this courtroom example, people are always skipping the motive when they're writing essays and then jumping right to the evidence. Well, thank you so much, Scott. This was really great. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I want to I wanna take a, a five minute break before we move into our next presentation. So um, students, uh, if you, you know, want to duck out and grab a drink of water or grab a snack or something before we start, we'll get started our next thing at two o'clock. But uh, once again, just thanks so much, Scott. And uh, we really appreciate having you here today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.